Okay. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started this evening. Okay. Again, Father, we thank you for the privilege of uh, hearing you speak to us through your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who enables us to understand what you're saying to us. And above all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who is our great good shepherd. Enable us to comprehend truth tonight and then obey it and apply it to our daily walk. In the strong name of Christ we pray, amen. Well, we come to the last verse in chapter uh, Psalm 23 tonight, verse 6. I'll not finish this verse, but we'll start on it. We have been on a journey with the shepherd and the sheep. And again, remember that the key to understanding the 23rd Psalm is in the little sixth verse phrase, in the house of the Lord. And for the Hebrew mind, that was not just going to the temple. It was not just knowing I'm going to heaven when I die. It was the presence of God with them moment by moment by moment. So we've been on the journey with the shepherd. You'll remember in the springtime, he brings them out of the sheepfold where they've spent the winter and they're headed to the highlands where the grass will be green and, and luscious, where they can find the still waters. He's taking them step by step, watching over them, protecting them. Even when they go through the valley of dark shadows, and it's hard for us to understand as Christians that we do have valleys. We're not immune from those difficult times. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. And if we're not prepared for that, when they come, it devastates us. That's why a lot of people drop out of church. That's why a lot of people say, I don't want to deal with this anymore, and they just stop. Valleys are a part of life, and the shepherd will take us all the way through them. And that's why David said, when I walk through them, not if, but when I walk through them. All along the way, there is a journey that we are on. And we have a shepherd that is watching over us. He's protecting us. He's taking care of us. He's feeding us. He's nourishing us. He loves us. It's exciting and it ought to be exciting in every believer's life to know that the shepherd, when we enter into that relationship with him, has a plan for our life. I don't even know where I found this. I wrote it down. <clears throat> I don't even know who said it. What a challenging thought it is to have a shepherd like that. One who has purposes for our lives. Who has blueprints already drawn. Who has specifications written out. Who has in his mind's eye a great purpose for our lives. Isn't that great? He's already got the blueprint. And how many times do we mess that blueprint up? Or we step out of that path because we stray? Hmm. Nothing now or vulgar, nothing low or vulgar or foul or selfish or stubborn will please him. Wow. A lot of stubborn sheep. A lot of stubborn sheep. No life that measures on missing the mark of rebellion or willfulness can please him. The good shepherd leads us directly out into the place to graze. He rejoices to see the restored vigor and strength that have come from his loving touch. Wow. He wants to guide us. Now, as we've made our way to the highlands, when we get to verse 6, and it's hard for us to comprehend this because we don't know the, the, the Eastern culture. They've reached the mountains, however long they stay there, now they're headed back down. Perhaps it is getting close to winter again, and they'll, they'll spend another few months in that sheep pen, in that enclosure. And they're headed back down. What a vivid picture this is for all of us. The journey has been long and hard, I'm sure. Some of the street sheep have strayed. Some of the lambs have had to be disciplined. But now they're headed back to that sheepfold. And it is a wonderful thing for you and me to understand the moment we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he becomes our shepherd. 
We're in the flock. And that's why John 10 tells us, My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and I know them. What a wonderful thing to know that the shepherd knows us by name. He knows where I am. He knows who I am. I'm never out of his watch care. I'm never out of his love. And then the absolute assurance that it is an eternal forever relationship. Boy, the writer of Hebrews calls it a great salvation. It covers all of our life from the moment the journey starts until we come back on that journey until we reach the end. And this is why David wrote this psalm. The shepherd is taking care of his sheep. And now we come to this last verse. Usually when I start a study of this, I will pose this question at the beginning of it. There are two shepherd dogs in here. Would you find their names for me? I've got all kind of answers on that one. Listen to what he's saying. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's that little phrase, in the house of, in the presence of. What a great comfort it is to know that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and every moment of my life, He is there not only with me, He's in me. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a permanent, eternal relationship that is. So now David is telling us, as the shepherd is making his way back down the mountains, they're headed home to that sheepfold. Two things. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Those are the two sheepdogs. Goodness, uh, whatever translation you're reading out of, that word mercy should better be translated loving kindness. I'll get to that in a moment. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now think about that for a moment. The moment I entered into the relationship with the Father, the moment I became a part of the flock, God dispatched those two dogs to take care of me. Oh, and they follow me. They're always with me. Sometimes they're nipping at my heels when I'm stepping out of line. Or they're moving ahead of me and pushing me back where I need to be. But all the days of my life, these two dogs never, ever, ever leave, leave me. And that little word surely in the Hebrew is an affirmation of truth. I can count on that. If you are an animal lover, you've got two dogs you may not even knew about. Goodness and mercy. Always with you, surely. That's an affirmation of certainty. And sometimes we're not even aware these dogs are following us. So what are these dogs? What does this mean to me? Here's the first one. Goodness. Let me see if I can explain that. This is one of the attributes of God. His nature, his character. We treat, teach children to say that prayer, God is great, God is good. And we never explain to them how God is good. What do you mean by that? And because we have a an English conception of the word good, we never really understand what that means in biblical terms. But this is the first shepherd dog that nips at my heels all the days of my life. The word good in the Hebrew is a word that describes the totality and the fullness of the blessings of God for those who belong to Him. The totality the fullness of the blessings of God. One of the best ways to interp interpret Scripture is to let Scripture interpret itself. So if you'll take that little word good or goodness and run it through the Bible, you'll find verses that help us to understand what goodness is when it's related to God. In verse 31, it's Psalm 31, verse 19, David said, How great... 
is your goodness. How great is your goodness. And that word great in the Hebrew describes magnitude. Many expressions of that goodness. It's a great goodness. And what he is saying to you and me tonight, I can never exhaust the goodness of God. I could never count up all of my blessings that God has given to me. And how often we take that for granted. The blessings that God gives to us. How great is your goodness that you have stored up and there's the condition for those that fear you. For those that have taken refuge in you before the sons of men. Wow, what a great thought that is for you and me. He stored that up. And I don't have time to go through all of this uh, word by word. That In verse 19, how great is your goodness which you stored up for those who fear you which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you. Watch this, before the sons of men. Wow, he has stored this up. The word stored up means to treasure something. And you treasure it because of the value of it, because it is worth something. You put it in a, a, a safe or... Banks aren't always safe, but you put it somewhere. It's valuable. You store it up. Now, this is what David is saying. God has stored up his goodness for all of those who take refuge in him. And in verse 20, you hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracy of man. I love that 20th verse. Hmm. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. You had everybody, ever had anybody talking about you? Or coming at you? If you've been in the Baptist church long enough, you certainly have. If you hadn't, let me, you take my place as a pastor for a while. God hides those who love him from the strife of tongues. Sometimes I'll pray that for all the garbage that's going on in Washington. Father, confuse their tongues. Just scramble it up so they don't even know what they're saying because they're so vile and corrupt. God stores up his goodness. Up his goodness for us. But before the sons of men, let me tell you what this means, folks, and I know you get tired of me saying that. You're setting an example for somebody. When you miss church, you're setting an example for somebody that's watching you. They're watching your life day in and day out. And God said that goodness that I've stored up for you is before the sons of men. The world is watching us. Watching us to see whether or not what we're professing with our lips is being lived out consistently in our lives. Somebody's watching you. Somebody is always watching you. Huh? In Psalm 16, verse 2. I don't have time to go through all these verses. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord and I have no good beside you. Greatest thing you and I possess tonight is God. He's a great God. He's a good God. The excellence of his nature. And now David is saying, I have no other goodness in this life but you, and it's all wrapped up in the person of Yahweh. That's the best that I have. It's in Jesus. We don't seem to understand that. So He's not priority in so many lives. In Psalm 25, verse 8, and I'm flying through these verses. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. It, that word instruct is the word in Hebrew from which we get the word Torah and the word Torah is the word that describes the whole law that God gave to the nation of Israel 
He's directing my life moment by moment by moment through and by his word. That's why we have to stay in the word of God. Stay there. Meditating in it. Allowing God to direct us, to instruct us. Oh. And yet where our lives are directed by everything under the sun but his word, his goodness, his greatness. Wow. In Psalm 34, verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The word refuge, and that's the name of our church. That word refuge in the Hebrew is a word that simply describes a place of shelter where you and I can go. Protection. God is saying taste and trust. Taste my word. Trust my word. Evaluate everything in your life from the perspective of Scripture Run it back through the Word of God and see if it squares up. And if it doesn't, you have to dismiss it. Don't rationalize something away because you want it. Don't do that. Bring it back through the Word of God. And when you begin to taste and trust, then you begin to see that God is all that He said He is. And He will do all that He said He would do. And I can trust that. This is one of those shepherd dogs that's always at my heel. Goodness. Let me give one from the New Testament. I've been over in the Old Testament. Uh, We've already looked at this one in John chapter 10. This is the Lord Jesus himself speaking. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd has laid down his life for his sheep. Goodness. I was sharing in class last night. We were closing out on Jonah. We, We don't take seriously the Great Commission. Jonah was running away because he didn't like the Assyrians. They were cruel people. He had a right to distrust them. They were wicked, mean, cruel people. But God said, I love them. You go tell them. You bring this message of repentance to them. And their people, we're we're like that today. We're caught up in all of our prejudices and our own opinions. And sometimes we delight in something happening to people. Jonah got mad because God spared that city. They repented at the preaching. And in the Hebrew, the sermon he brought was only five words. Isn't that amazing? Five words he preached. And over 600,000 people repented. Goodness. And instead of rejoicing, how many missionaries today would be excited to have that kind of response somewhere? Jonah is sitting up on a hillside angry and resentful and mad and bitter toward God and literally saying, I told you that's what's going to happen. That's why I went in the other direction. Wow. He was more concerned about a gourd tree than he was about souls. And we're like that. We can say we're not, but we are. We have opportunities every day to share Jesus with people. And we don't. We just don't. The good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. And I was sharing with them last night, one of the professors of evangelism in New Orleans, who had written a, who wrote a book on evangelism, said the problem with a lot of Christians and their salvation, they've gotten over it. They've gotten over the joy and the thrill of knowing forgiveness of sin of realizing that Jesus Christ became our sin bearer and our substitute who did die in our place. We've gotten over all of that. Just got over it. The good shepherd lay down his life for me. 
that enables me to become a member of his flock, to come, become one of his sheep, and then have the absolute assurance that he's going to direct my step all the way, every moment of the journey. And I've got a sh one shepherd dog that is goodness, always at my heels, always to my side, always in front of me. What a tremendous truth that is. Over in Psalm 135, the psalmist cries out, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. I will praise God for his goodness. Uh -huh. Isn't that wonderful? Do we praise him for his goodness? Father, I thank you, and I praise you for who you are. I thank you that you've dispatched that shepherd dog to me for me, goodness. That he's always behind me, before me, beside me. Always. And your goodness can never be exhausted. I can't count your blessings. I just can't do it. They're innumerable. And I receive them every day. And we're just not thankful for that. We're just not thankful for that. That's the first shepherd dog. But there's another one. My daughter has, my granddaughter has two Australian shepherds, Maya and Ty. They're, <coughs> they're two of the most spoiled dogs I've ever seen in my life. And they sit in her lap constantly. Ma is the younger one. She has the, the strangest eye. Australian shepherds have strange eyes. But she just sits in, in Hannah's lap and just puts her head right here. She loves her master. And I've got a master that loves me. I've got a shepherd dog named Goodness, and I've got a second shepherd dog named Loving Kindness. Loving Kindness. Kindness. Now, your translation may say mercy, and that's fine, but that really does not do justice to what this word means. It's not a good translation. The word it, that is really loving kindness, and, and I've shared this with you before, there is no word in the hum, human, uh, English language, no word in the English language that can fully describe and define God's loving kindness. It's his covenant love. The love that entered into that relationship with Abraham and chose the nation of Israel. And for you and me, it's the new covenant of the shed blood of Jesus, his broken body and poured out wine, his death on the cross. It's loving kindness. It is steadfast love it is faithful love it is redeeming love it is saving love it is teaching love oh. it's all summed up in the word covenant name of God I am I am this is my covenant name Moses my loyal faithful teaching steadfast Love, it's unconditional love. I am the sustaining God. I am the God with whom you can have a relationship. And when I enter into that relationship, I now have become a recipient of that loving kindness. And again, when we say all these things about this word loving, I haven't exhausted the meaning of it. There's really no way in the English language to do that. Goodness, over in Hosea chapter 2, verse 19, God speaking to the nation of Israel who had walked away from his love, had prostituted themselves before the world with idols. And you, uh, we went through Hosea on a Wednesday night. God told that prophet, I want you to go marry a woman by the name of Gomer. 
And I want you to understand after you marry Gomer, she's going to become unfaithful. She'll bear you children, and then she'll become unfaithful to you and leave you and the children. And it happened just the way God prophesied. Hmm. Hard to imagine that. Here's the prophet of God. And yet he never stopped loving Gomer. It's a beautiful picture through the life of a man of God by the name of Hosea. She's left him. She's become a prostitute. She's selling her body. And so you come to that third chapter and all of a sudden you're in the middle of something you can't comprehend. So let me, let me see if I can paint that picture for us here. It's late one night. Hosea has put the children to bed. He's sitting in the den in his lazy boy chair. The fireplace is, is, is blazing. And he's lost deep in thought. And all of a sudden the silence of God shatters that silence. The voice of God shatters that silence. Hosea? Hosea, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about Gomer tonight. I wonder where she is. Do you still love Gomer, Hosea, knowing that she's become unfaithful to you? Hosea thought for a moment. He said, I do love her, God. I still love her. Well, Hosea, if you love her, I'm going to tell you how you can get her back. She has sunk so deep into sin, she had to sell herself into slavery. And tomorrow morning, they're going to auction her off in the slave market. And you can go down into that slave market and you can buy Gomer back. And if you choose to do that, Hosea, I'm going to show you and show the nation of Israel how much I love you and love the nation of Israel and love the whole world. Hosea didn't sleep a wink that night. Got up early the next morning, took care of the children, went down to the slave market waiting for the auction to begin. It began to swell with people. And all of a sudden, here was the auctioneer in front of the crowd, and the first slave to be auctioned off that morning was a pale, emaciated woman whose face was marked with the years of living in sin, and she stood there naked before that crowd. And he opened up the bidding, and not a sound from anybody. They knew who she was. They understood who this woman was. And all of a sudden, a hand shot up, and he cried out, I bid 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. And the crowd began to buzz. Who is that man? Doesn't he understand what this woman is? Somebody looked a little closer, and they said, That's Hosea. That's the prophet of God. That's that woman's husband. Fifteen shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Nobody else made a bid. Going, going, God sold Hosea. Can't you just picture that? The prophet of God coming to that slave box and reaching up with his hand and taking hold of the hand of his wife leading her off of that slave block and out of that slave market because he had paid the purchase price. In Hebrew, it would be redeemed her. He redeemed her. Do you know what the selling price was for her? Fifteen shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. And if you'd taken that homer and a half of barley down to the grain market, it would have sold for fifteen shekels of silver. You know what Hosea paid for his wife? Thirty shekels of Pieces of silver. And over 2,000 years ago, our Lord was betrayed for that same amount and went to the cross to redeem us. That's how much God loves us. And he's dispatched that shepherd dog. Wow. Not only am I in a saving relationship with him, but now I daily know his loving kindness. Not only his goodness, but his loving kindness. That's a picture of the nation of Israel. They walked away from their Messiah, their Lord. 
And in Hosea chapter 2, this is what God said in verse 9, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in loving kindness, and in compassion. Wow. Goodness. And we go through all the seasons and just celebrate and never, ever consider the depth of all of this. We'll be on Christmas before you know it, and that's the day God stepped out of eternity and became that which he had never been. He became a man, clothed himself with flesh so that he could live a sinless, perfect life and go to the cross and be our sin bearer. And we've just celebrated Easter as he died in our place. Came out of that grave and God said, This is my son. This is my son. And we all, if you grew up in church, you know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. The good shepherd lay down his life for his sheep. And now the moment I put my faith and trust in him, I am betrothed to that bridegroom forever and forever and forever. And one day there's going to be a wedding feast. There'll be a wedding and a wedding feast. He's coming for his bride one day, and it may be sooner than we recognize with everything that just keeps going south in this country. It just, you, you wake up every morning and you can't believe what you're hearing. Absolutely cannot believe what you're hearing. Huh? I am betrothed to him. That's redeeming love. That's keeping love. That's saving love. It's a love that Paul said in Romans chapter 5 has been poured out in my life. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I'm in that covenant relationship. Now I know not only the goodness of God, but I know His loving kindness. And I'm so thankful tonight, it's not a love based on feelings and emotions. Ours usually is, and that's why we're up and down as Christians, because we relate to God on the basis of a phileo love, emotional love. Well, I don't feel like going to church this morning. i got something more important to do. I just won't go. No, no. No, no. I remember when I was in evangelism, I was preaching on... There's a difference in phileo love and agape love. Phileo love is an emotional feeling love. Agape love has nothing to do with feelings and emotions. It's an act of the will. And I was sharing that concept, and, and the lady that played one of the instruments, I don't remember if it was piano organ, she came up to me one night, she said, you know, I've never thought about that. And there are a lot of Christians like that. It, it, we relate to God on the way, a basis of our feelings and emotion. I don't feel like going today. I don't feel like reading my Bible. It's an act of the will. I go whether I feel like it or not. My goodness. I was thinking about that this afternoon, walking. I don't know where I was walking. So, but, uh, you know, you're going to spend eternity praising God. We have trouble doing that down here, folks. And yet we're going to, in eternity, that's what we're going to be doing. You'll never get out of church in eternity. Goodness gracious. Wow. Oh, preacher, that's preacher talk. No, that's not preacher talk. No, nope, not at all. I was sharing at the table a while ago, one of my students who pastors down out of uh, Hall Summit put this on Facebook this week. The more you miss church, the less you miss church. You miss church, and then it doesn't bother you to keep on missing church. Wow. Wow. And so today we let everything under the sun come between us and that steadfast love. And all the time that shepherd dog is nipping at our heels and nipping at our heels. Wow. The shepherd dogs of goodness and loving kindness. 
Dr. Watts that I quote all the time, I will, who was the Hebrew scholar. I'll have to close with this. Loving kindness is the crown of God's goodness. It is the fruit of God's grace. It is the keeping of God's promise. It is the fulfillment of God's covenant. It is the means of God's ransom. It is the seal of God's victory. It is the salvation of God's beloved. And still you have not exhausted that word. I've shared with you several times. My grandmother and great-grandmother prayed me into the ministry. And that used to irritate me so bad. My great-grandmother died when she was 97, and I don't think I ever went into her room. She lived with my grandmother, that she didn't have an open Bible in her hand. And she was always singing this song, and I, I never, it, it never fazed me at that moment because I was so mad at her praying for me to be a preacher. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to your bosom fly. Wow. That's a love that's not fake and phony. It's real. It is genuine. It's not plastic. It's unconditional, saving, keeping, ministering, sustaining love. And those two dogs follow me. I'll have to finish this up next week. That word follow in the Hebrew literally means to pursue. Pursue. Dogs can run fast. I had a Dalmatian, and I watched her one day when I let her out the back door suddenly move at the speed of light, and she caught a bird in midair in her mouth. And that's what that word means. Follow me means to pursue me. Always with me. Well, we'll stop here. A any prayer requests tonight? I've got some. Well, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Father, that you are our great good shepherd. We thank you for your goodness and loving kindness. You've heard the request tonight. You know every individual and every family and every circumstance involved, even before we voice this. You know what the needs are, and I pray that you would minister to those needs in a way that would bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus, that would not only meet those needs, but present Jesus to them. For those that may not know you, they might be drawn to the Savior. And for those that do, they might be strengthened in your grace and your mercy. Be with Awana tonight as they meet. Use the teachers to share your word with them. And I pray this week, Father, that the rest of this week we would be faithful to share your goodness and love and kindness through Jesus Christ. In the precious name we pray. Jesus, amen.